Hello, I am particularly delighted to be joined today by Paul Rogers, who many of you will know, uh, Emeritus Professor of Peace Studies at Bradford University, one of the preeminent experts, I would say globally, on issues to do with conflicts. Many of you may have seen the videos I've done with him on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but it would be amiss not to talk to, to you, Paul, given your expertise on the horror, which is currently enveloping Gaza um, over the last... The last two months or so. Um, firstly, yeah, I suppose this is something which I think is under-discussed. By the way, great to see you. Sorry. Hello. That was a, a breach of etiquette. Lovely to see you. You too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose partly, I mean, I wonder what your thoughts on this in terms of what Hamas's strategy was on the 7th of October. Um, because Hamas wouldn't have done this, and the other armed groups, of course, uh, but principally Hamas, unless they must have known what the response would be. And therefore, in a sense... Yeah. Perhaps they had a script, and that script is now being followed. I'm interested in what you think about that, and I don't know if you have thought maybe actually Hamas didn't expect uh, to have, you know, they had a maybe th that what happened and the atrocities that obviously were committed on the 7th of October, what but went on beyond what they themselves had predicted. What I don't know what you think about that in terms of what Hamas planned and whether or not Israel is essentially going doing what Hamas intended them to do. I'd liken it a little bit to what happened after 2001, after 9-11, because then when 9-11 happened, in the first 24, 36 hours, um, right across the Western world, there was mass support for the United States. I think it was the one of the uh, French dailies actually had its banner headline the following day, we are all Americans now. That dissipated fairly quickly when it was clear the United States was going to go into a major war. Uh, and if you turn the whole thing around, I think uh, Al-Qaeda, and to some extent the Taliban, but Al-Qaeda in particular, uh, were inciting the United States to attack them. And I think the reason for that was the Mujahideen back in the 1980s had, in the view of people like bin Laden, seen off the Soviet Union, a superpower, which then came apart at the seams. And I think they thought that if they could drag the United States into Afghanistan, uh, in a major way, you know, divisions of, of troops in the race, they would do the same to the US. They failed in the latter one originally because the Americans used special forces, uh, carpet bombing and support from the Northern Alliance warlords to get rid of the Taliban very quickly. But they came back and 20 years later, of course, uh, in a sense, they won. And Al-Qaeda is still there in different countries, including a lot of groups associated with it in North and Central Africa. So, and I think, in a sense, that was partly the way that Hamas saw it. Um, they had a specific reason for doing it around about now, because they were concerned that as Israel was getting these diplomatic agreements with uh, Gulf states, Bahrain for a start, but possibly Saudi Arabia, then in a sense the, the Palestinian cause would be sidelined even more. It'd become a, um, a sort of an abstraction almost. So I think that was one reason, certainly. They seem to have been planning this operation for a, at least a year, maybe two years. And there have been lots of trial runs, which the Israelis had not actually picked up on. I think Hamas, therefore, was actually doing this a deliberate uh, thing to get retaliation. They expected strong retaliation from Israel, and they expected basically to grind Israel down, or at least move public opinion worldwide in their favor. So I think that's where they were coming from. The actual events of the 7th of October uh, were extraordinary. And I think they found it actually easier than they expected. They broke through the barrier, you know, this apparently impenetrable barrier, in 15 to 20 different places in the space of maybe a couple of hours. And they, they poured the best part of 2,000 of their younger men into uh, Israel, some of whom behaved absolutely appallingly. Um, the Israelis tried to respond fairly quickly but it took them more than 24 hours to actually get right back into many parts of that uh, southwest part of Israel. One example of what Hamas was able to do, it sent a small group, I think just on three motorbikes, four or five people on three motorbikes, deep into southern Israel, and in fact uh, attacked a small but key command point, which actually looked after the whole of the fence. That command post was not actually near the fence, it was several kilometers inland. And essentially they were able to kill the people responsible for that. And it meant that the connections between the fence all the way around Gaza and the rest of the Israeli armed forces was cut in the sense, in the, in the telecommunication sense. So they had a lot of planning done, but in really in answer to your 
proper question. I think they wanted and expected major retaliation. Now, whether the extent of the Israeli retaliation, which has been absolutely vast and crippling, um, was what they expected, I do not know. But what is clear now, that after more than two months, we're fairly well into the third month of the war. After that time, the war is actually going <clears throat> even slower for the Israelis uh, than we were led to believe. I mean, the events of last week here are central here, and I think we need to recognize this. Um, through to about Monday of last week, um, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, were saying repeatedly that the war is going our way. Uh, we've taken control of more or less most of northern Gaza. Hamas has been dealt with, and we're going to move on in spite of the huge human costs and the current, the, the, the whole movement of um, Palestinians into different parts of Gaza. Then you have this extraordinary event in which you have basically a, a very carefully planned triple ambush. Uh, what they did first, the, the Hamas paramilitaries, was to attack a small but quite significant Israeli unit, part of the key, uh, key brigade of theirs, uh, and that actually happened almost sort of unexpectedly. But as the people who were killed and injured in that, the injured people were going to be rescued by others, the other group that was rescuing them was itself ambushed. And then a third group was ambushed as well. Now, the overall result of this, we're not quite sure, but we know that a senior Israeli officer, a colonel level officer, a battalion commander was killed, three majors, uh, were also killed, and a number of other officers and, and one or two conscripts, about 10 people. Uh, now, that for the Israeli Defense Forces to lose in one incident, um, when these were the elite people, these were, I think, the Golani Brigade, which is probably the leading infantry brigade in the Israeli Defense Forces. And um, that showed, I think, unequivocally that, in fact, um, Hamas is still far more entrenched in Gaza than you would expect. And the other point, of course, is that we still have, after what is it, um, more than two months of the war, uh, the hostages unaccounted for. Israel simply does not know where they are. Uh, and so I think when you get that picture, that may indicate that, in fact, uh, for Gaza, for the Hamas in Gaza, this is not going as badly as people would be led to believe. And we're certainly getting that now in that the Israelis are saying pretty openly, this is going to go on through the rest of uh, December into January into February. And the real problem for them is whether they're going to be able to do that with the way in which world opinion is really tiding very strongly against them. And you're seeing this whole range of demonstrations repeatedly yeah. in the United States, of course, as well as Britain, where the demonstrations that are happening every day around the country are not diminishing in size. If anything, they're increasing. So I know a long answer to what you say. So I think Hamas did see this largely coming. This was a planned operation, uh, and they had many young people who were expecting to die. That's the crucial, crucial thing, almost an eschatological development implication of this is if you have young people who are paramilitaries you can call them terrorists if you want it's a term that i avoid using but essentially if they are in, determined to die for a cause then that is extremely difficult to handle as people found with al-qaeda isis and others just in terms of i mean because i'll ask more obviously about in terms of the military campaign on the ground but since i've not spoke to you since this all began i'm just wondering quickly on your thoughts about on 7th of october it's not just the astonishing actually real failure on the part of of mossad which is one of the world's most sophisticated security agencies security services and um, who have extensive spy network i would imagine throughout gaza but but the the failure to defend those southern communities i'm just wondering would you just is that a lot to do with the fact the IDF are basically in the West Bank, many of them protecting those illegal settlements? Do you think that had a lot to do with it? No, I think it's actually a lot worse than that from an IDF perspective. Just going back historically, I mean, uh, the IDF grew out of the very early um, Israeli fighters back in 1947-48. Um, they, of course, were hugely affected, never forget this, hugely affected by the scars of the Holocaust, which was an immediate thing there. You know, six million Jews had been killed in three or four years. And before that, in the 1930s, they'd been in an extremely difficult position. Even by 1946, 47, um, Jews were a minority in what was still called Palestine then. 
and uh, they were not in fact in a majority until after the Nakba and after many of the um, Palestinians had been uh, basic, basically booted out. But really from that position on, when there'd been conflicts between the Israelis and the Palestinians, then you have what is, is generally known as what's called the, the Tahir Doctrine coming in. And this has its origins back in, uh, uh, what was it, 1982. Tahir is a district south of, uh, south of Beirut. And when the Israelis were trying to sort out parts of Beirut, uh, they basically found it extremely difficult in and around Beirut. They laid siege to the city. Probably the best part of 10,000 people were killed in the 1982 war. But if you then fast forward to 2006, when the Israelis were trying to do something about the rockets which Hezbollah was fighting, and Hezbollah had its origins back in that early 1980s, when they were trying to basically respond to those which were getting very serious, they went into uh, essentially southern Lebanon, both with ground troops, including the Golani Brigade, and with very heavy air power. The Golani Brigade suffered then, but in the air power, this was when the Israelis used this tactic of massive uh, civilian damage, huge econ um, economic structure damage for anybody connected with even the vaguest way of the Hezbollah and indeed the state as a whole. So you had really this feeling from 2006 onwards that however the difficulties, the Israelis knew how to handle it. And when, you know, within a year or two, uh, Hamas had taken control of Gaza, then you had repeated efforts by the Israelis to maintain uh, the control there. And you had what, four wars before the current one. And in those wars, the, the biggest probably was in, well, probably 2007 8, but also 2014, uh, Operation Protective Edge, I think it was called. Again, the Israelis found it extremely tricky to do it in a ground invasion. Once again, it was the Golani Brigade which suffered most in that case, but they used massive force. Um, and in those four wars together, uh, the Israelis had lost about, I think, 300, 350 of their personnel. Um, they killed 5,000 Palestinians. And what it produced, of course, was new generations of very angry young men who were willing to join uh, Hamas. Now, I know there's a bit of a long way answers. I think in recent times, um, the Israelis basically came to the conclusion that they got it sorted. That, in fact, you know, Israel could live, live in peace and security in terms of its own outlook. And I think this is probably heightened by the way in which Israel moved notably to the right. In the 1980s, 1990s rather, this is because of a wave of immigrating Russia and the rest, which was then allowable in a sense. Uh, um, that, those were all people who were desperate to ensure their own security, having come to Israel quite late in the day. But Israel as a whole became a country which I think is best described as a country which is impregnable in its insecurity. It has to feel impregnable, but it is also fundamentally insecure because of where it is. And that is something which I think is almost inescapable. But up until just 10 or 12 weeks ago, the Israelis were confident that they were on top of things. And I think essentially there was a degree of, well, hubris, if not arrogance, that, you know, nobody would come after them. That, you know, if Hamas did this, they knew exactly what they would suffer from. You know, the Dahia doctrine would, would kick in and it would be massive. Um, well, massive destruction, which would extend to civilians. And they were wrong. Uh, Hamas had actually been able to do this in a way which was completely unexpected. But you know, again, look at it. You know, we thought that, uh, or people thought that the Taliban and Al Qaeda had been dealt with within 10 weeks back in 2001. Oh. Uh, in 2003, uh, the statue of Saddam Hussein came down three weeks into the Gaza, in, into the uh, Iraq war and the assumption Mission accomplished. Was that, yes, it was it was a conflict. Uh, and so I think it was really letting the guard down in a way which is disastrous. And it also explains part of the reasons for this incredible action that the Israelis are now taking. In, in terms of um, what happens on the ground now, in fact, this was put by a former student uh, of yours to me, actually. I, I, I said on Patreon that I was interviewing you, and uh, Afia says, I stood in Paul Rogers and completed my first year dissertation on the rise of Hamas and the occupied territories following the Oslo Accord. Um, and they were asking if, if you know, can Hamas be eradicated militarily um, and express scepticism? And if not, why is this not being challenged more? Um, and I suppose if we look, because you mentioned Afghanistan, 
And, you know, I interviewed, for example, Anand Gopal, who's an expert on Afghanistan, who pointed out to me that the Taliban essentially evaporated in 2001 and were rebuilt because of the counterinsurgency program uh, led by the US, um, who basically mm. won lots of recruits uh, to the Taliban yeah. because of the horrors unleashed partly by the uh, coalition forces. But I suppose, I mean, the the, the, the counter argument to that is, well, Afghanistan is a graveyard of foreign invaders. Um, it has been, it was for the British in the 19th century, obviously was for the Soviets, and it proved again for the American-led coalition, uh, who all suffered defeat. Um, but that's the geography of Afghanistan helps. But Gaza is a tiny strip the size of East London. Yes, there are tunnels, but those tunnels can be destroyed. So is it possible that they could achieve those ends in a way that you couldn't in Afghanistan, essentially because of the geography of Afghanistan, which is what has always helped repel foreign invaders? I think it's almost impossible for the Israeli Defense Forces to destroy Hamas, uh, probably totally, because even if they were able to claim they destroyed it, then another movement would rise, because the basic problem is... Uh, well, bluntly, the suppression of Palestinians in Gaza and indeed the West Bank, which we're forgetting about. So, yeah. yes, it, I think the Israelis, particularly the Israeli Defense Forces, think they can do it. But I think you've got to tease that apart a bit because you've got three different things interacting to produce something of a perfect storm. The one is, and we must never forget, 7th of October was an utter shock to the Israelis. It almost like the, the whole carpet being pulled from under them what they thought was a secure state turned out not to be. And this, this does go back in part to the Holocaust. You know, okay, there are virtually no Holocaust survivors now, but in so many Israeli families, there's direct connections. So we should never underestimate that. But there are two other very big factors. One is that the Israeli government under Netanyahu is really seriously far right. Uh, more than that, it's not just far right, but it's currently only able to stay in power because you have two, um, I think many people would have used the term extreme uh, movements, the small the, the, the groups. I mean, you, you've got the groups which are religious fundamentalists very clearly. Uh, and I think they, in a sense, are very powerful. I mean, I think particularly you get somebody like, uh, I suppose, um, uh, Bezalel Smutrich, who, who is basically one of the cabinet members. You've got uh, Itmar Ben-Gvir, who really is in charge of security within the West Bank. He is not so much on the religious side, but you also have um, sort of what you might call the super Zionists. Uh, turbo Zionism is, is a, a, a term which some people are starting to use because you have a, people who utterly believe um, that Israel must be a pure uh, Jewish state uh, and nothing more. And one has to remember that, in fact, if you take the Likud party, you look at its statement of aims it's almost its charter the first part of that charter says that israel is a sovereign country which stretches from the river to the sea and that must be under complete israeli sovereignty from that perspective israel is already a single state uh, and this is why you know the old idea of a, a sort of two-state solution with uh, liquid in power is frankly pretty nonsensical so you've got you've got the government which absolutely believes in that and I think also, of course, you have the issue of um, uh, Netanyahu determined to survive. If you put all those together, uh, then we have a situation which, as I say, is akin to um, really a, a per perfect storm. One thing to add, though, people therefore assume that the Israeli people as a whole are all in favor of what's going on at present and, and that Hamas can be destroyed. Not everybody feels that way. I mean, there's some very brave people. What is it? The, the Women Wage Peace in Israel and Palestine, the movement of women from Israeli and Palestinian ranks who've basically been trying to work together even now. I mean, one of the ordinary, mm -hmm. extraordinary ironies was, I think it was on the 3rd or 4th of October this year, there was a gathering of several thousand people from across the divide who were actually working together, women working together. Um, and it, it, some of the other areas, you know, uh, was it Mir Sharon, Mir um, uh, Salam, it's Salam. And that, anyway, there, there is one particular town in Israel which is intentionally um, a Jewish and uh, Palestinian town. Uh, and that succeeded for many years. So there are other groups, but I think ultimately at the present, uh, the Israelis will stand for what Netanyahu and his group is doing. That will probably 
collapse if this war goes on very much longer, but it is still currently strong. Put it all together, and this explains what the Israelis are doing and how far they're actually going, which is frankly appalling, as we all know. Just in terms of other precedents, just because Iraq is something you've you've written on so extensively. Um, when and by the way, I should just say it's very important you did mention the Israeli peace activists who are so courageous and brave. I've interviewed yeah. many of them. Uh, do people should check out the interview I've done with Italia Ben Abba, who's a refusenik who was sent to prison for refusing yeah. to serve in the occupation. Ariel Bernstein, who's a soldier, who a former IDF soldier, who's part of breaking the silence, who brings yeah. together conscience objectives incredibly brave people and standing together who I've also interviewed at length who bring together Palestinian citizens of Israel and Jewish citizens. Anyway, um, just in terms of precedence, Iraq. So when I was interviewed by uh, uh, Piers Morgan, lucky me, um, he tried to make a argument based on um, the counterinsurgency program against ISIS in Iraq, which I know the Israeli authorities keep talking about as well. The point I did make to him is he was missing out history, which was after the invasion of Iraq, you had the counterinsurgency program against Al Qaeda, who themselves partly came out of the the, Israeli, the Iraqi army was shut down. You had all these dispossessed men, with lots of guns, and they, you know, you had the massacres in cities like Fallujah by the U.S. soldiers, and that became an insurgency with Al Qaeda. And then the suppression of Al Qaeda helped breed another, um, helped rise, uh, ferment the rise of ISIS, which was even more extreme than Al Qaeda. But I'm just interested in what your thoughts about the counterinsurgency in Iraq, uh, in the Sunni populations, um, and when people say, well, ISIS was suppressed by a counterinsurgency program, what do you think about those parallels? There is some truth in it. I mean, if you take the period between 2004 and 2007 or 8, then yes, that was when the Americans basically gave up what they were trying to do with traditional counterinsurgency, often using troops who weren't prepared, well prepared or trained for it. Then they moved in by using uh, really special forces on a substantial scale. Uh, and in fact, there were there were four different units. There was Task Force North, uh, West, East and Black. And these really divided different parts of Baghdad and the wider areas into zones which were extremely well armed and well resourced. Uh, as it happened, one of those uh, four groups was from the SAS. Uh, it was, I think, the Sabre Battalion of the SAS. Uh, and they were basically, the way these worked was if they got any kind of um, intelligence uh, that there was a particular compound somewhere in which there were uh, basically the, the insurgents present, then they would do a night raid, helicopter raid, using, you know, night vision and the rest, and pounce and kill and hopefully capture some of them. Uh, the ones who were captured would be subject to I think it's politely called robust physical intelligence. And if they got further information from them, there might be other raids staged in the same hours of darkness that same night. Now, there was something like, I think it was up to 100 of these raids going on uh, virtually every month. Uh, and this, in fact, it did lead, apart from anything else, in a slightly different way to the death of Zakawi, who was the key person in the development of al-Qaeda in Iraq. But it did actually suppress the insurgency to an extent. In fact, by 2008, it was one of the things which allowed um, Obama uh, to say that you know, the Iraq war was now a bad war and the United States should withdraw, whereas he still believed that Afghanistan was, quote, a good war because it's in more complete connections with 9-11. But as far as Iraq was concerned, you therefore had this situation which it seemed to have worked. But by 2011-12, you already had the beginnings of the next phase. And as you said, ISIS was developing. You had that absolutely shocking area, or a shock to the system in what was it? I think it was May, June 2014, where they took Mosul and basically declared that there was this new caliphate stretching across the northern part of Iraq through to the northern part of Syria. And this, of course, was the a caliphate with about six million people in it, which for a year or so ran almost as a, um, as a composite state. And then they were creating a caliphate, a, a historical entity. But of course, it was also hugely violent. You had the, uh, particularly the, um, the killing of the Yazidis and others. And in 2014, 15, uh, essentially, Obama started to bring in uh, this major operation, which turned into a full scale war, which was run through uh, the Trump era, with quite recent past now, through to 2018. And in that war, uh, there was virtually no use whatsoever of special forces. 
In fact, this is entirely an air war. I mean, that um, website, uh, Air Wars, chronicled this extremely well. I'm going from memory here, so one has to be careful. But if I remember rightly, something like 30,000 targets were attacked with like, something like 100,000 mostly precision guided weapons, primarily by the American Air Force, but with the French, the British and others also pretty heavily involved. Now, we don't have the figures for how many casualties there were. Uh, Air War certainly believed, and I think the Iraq body count people were doing work on this, that mm. there were some thousands of civilians killed. But certainly the American head of the American Special Operations Command actually put down that he reckoned about 60,000 ISIS supporters, as he called them, were killed in those four years. And Mosul, of course, was a, a eventually retaken, although it was the central Mosul, the old village, the old uh, city center was virtually destroyed. So you actually had what appeared to work then. Uh, but since then, what has happened? Well, we have ISIS-linked and Al-Qaeda-linked groups right across uh, the Sahel area of Africa, you know, from Mauritania in the west, right through to Chad and Niger and the rest, right through, in fact, down as far as Mozambique. You have these action, and they're basically developing their ideas and the tactics drawn from people who are right on the margins. You're still seeing these groups active in Iraq and Syria, the Americans are still doing pretty regular air raids in Syria, quite frequent, and you still get uh, disturbances and unrest in uh, Afghanistan. So mm. this has not gone away. It's not being covered in the way that it was in the Western media, but it's still happening. And if you read the military journals, you see that. So once again, even in spite of the apparent successes there, it's a short-term thing at most, which is why I would go back to the the idea that, in fact, what is happening in Gaza is going to be a success for the Israelis. Uh, it's very much, if you if you basically quote Tacitus, you know, we made a desert and called it peace. And mm -hmm. um, there's going to be peace breaking down in other ways, I'm afraid. I mean, in terms of Israel's campaign, military campaign, in terms of its brutality and also stated intent, um, I... For example, um, interviewed uh, Raz Sigal, who is an Israeli-American uh, academic. Um, he's a scholar in genocide and Holocaust studies. Um, and he said it was very rare for intent to be so overtly stated. I keep saying these in interviews, so people probably hear me, hear me repeat this a lot, but I think it's a critical point. Um, in that, you know, when you get the prime minister quoting Amalek in the Bible uh, to, you know, remember what Amalek did um, in the Bible, the Israelites were attacked by the nation of um, Amalek and God orders them to kill all men, women um, and children. Um, uh, whether it be saying there were no innocents in, in Gaza, human animals, uh, to there are two million Nazis in the West Bank, which is virtually the entire Palestinian uh, population. Um, you know, just language which is is so genocidal. Um, and that seems rare to me in, in conflicts. If I look at the Balkans, I don't recall, you know, the, the likes of Slobodan Milosevic denied their intents. You didn't generally get that kind of language. You got attempts to cover up what was happening. So I'm just wondering in terms of stated intent, but also how, what what precedent is there for the level of actual brutality? It's estimated now about 1% of Gaza's population or more has been killed in about two and a half months. I mean, what precedents are there for that both intent stated in conflict and also actual death, destruction, injury, that kind of thing? I think what we're seeing is really pretty rare. Um, I think it's actually one of the Israeli papers, Haratz, in fact, uh, published a report which was done. I'm not sure who did it, whether it was done in Israel or the United States, which was saying that the the intensity of the air war in, uh, in Gaza uh, was essentially unprecedented. I'm not absolutely sure about that, because when you look into detail for what the Americans, the French and the British and others did in and around Mosul in a relatively short period was pretty grim as well. I mean, the old city of Mosul was almost raised to the ground. Uh, people compared it to Stalingrad. So there may be other examples. And one has to say that, of course, on the other side, so to speak, um, the way in which um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS have gone on with their insurgencies has been truly brutal repeatedly. There is, I think, a difference here in that, and it comes back to a point I was trying to make earlier, and I'm not, I'm not I mean, I, I can't answer your question directly. I'm sort of going around it to try and throw light on it. I think if you look back at, I come time and time again to the utter shock 
for the Israelis, particularly the Israelis' right and particularly the Israeli Defense Forces, um, to uh, essentially suffer what they suffered. It was such an utter shock that they were suddenly becoming insecure. Then go back to what they were saying uh, back in, say, 2006, when you'd had the, the whole developments in Lebanon. Very similar phraseology was being used. I haven't got it in front of me now, but in fact, the general at the time, uh, Gazi, Gazi Eisenkot, um, really talked about this idea of a doctrine in which you published you, you punished far more people um, than were actually involved, and many of those would be civilians. Now, Eisenkot is not on the far right politically, uh, but is very uh, sort of pushy and tough in the military sense. He ended up as the Israeli chief of staff, and then he retired in 2019, and he brought back about six or eight weeks ago into the war cabinet. So it's a very small war cabinet, he's one of them. So essentially, this is really right at the heart of it. Uh, and as far as the IDF now determined to regain its possession, uh, its position as the guardians uh, of Judaism within Israel, um, then it really is insistent that this is correct to do. But as you say, when you're getting this kind of terminology used um, by senior people, as I say, you know, almost the day after uh, the whole business of the human animals. Now, to some extent, you can say, well, that's the utter shock of what had happened, but it's persisted. Uh, and this is where I think we are, I think, frankly, we're getting into very dangerous territory. And this is probably why, you know, there's a, a real change in attitude within the White House. Mm -hmm. I think some of them are sensible enough to see what's going on. But you always have to remember that the United States could more or less pull the plug on this war within days. Israel is so dependent on, on the resupply of weapons. I mean, the way these things work is Israel will have been very well equipped and very well resourced at the start. It would have very big reserves of equipment, very big reserves of bombs and the rest. Mm. But as those are being used up, it may still have some reserves, but it has to replace those reserves. And this is where the Americans come in with the many different uh, flights into Israel. And in fact, RAF Akrotiri, just across the water in Cyprus, acting as something of a local hub, which mm. involves both British planes, British C-17s, and of course, far more on the American side as well. So I think it's you're coming back to um, an insistence that essentially this whole problem of, well, basically the Palestinians must be dealt with once and for all. And because you have within the Israeli government uh, some real extreme elements, you know, as extreme as you'll see almost anywhere, uh, utter fundamentalists, then we're in a very difficult position. That does not in any way diminish the methods that Hamas is being used, which are appalling. Uh, but on the other hand, the misery that we're seeing uh, day by day, you know, thousands upon thousands of children um, just actually dying or being traumatized, probably a thousand infants dying. Um, mm. it, it is unparalleled in many ways, partly mm. because we are seeing it with our own eyes. And although most of this doesn't get into the British mainstream media, you see it on Al Jazeera and the other channels, uh, on English language channels. So this yeah. is why I think we're, we're dealing with something which is very different and potentially very dangerous. Uh, ju just a couple of other things. I mean, uh, just in terms of the claims, I guess, of Israel on the ground, Hamas is falling apart. I would note they've done um, supposedly these videos of su supposedly Hamas fighters surrendering, which have been extensively challenged, um, including, for example, journalists Al Jazeera and elsewhere. Uh, people are identifying actually those supposedly Hamas fighters, a lot of them are just, they're just civilians. They're including doctors, doctors, bakers, journalists. Um, and it seems that, you know, what they're doing is handing over guns, that kind of thing, but they've been, it's all been staged. It's not really happening uh, in order to obviously send a message, I guess, to Hamas, but also to domestic audiences in Israel that, uh, look, you're falling apart. You might as well give up now, surrender. And this basic psychological warfare, breaking the Geneva Convention in the process, because, of course, you cannot parade prisoners um, in front of cameras. That goes against the Geneva Conventions, as you know, but just so everyone knows. Um, so I'm just wondering, what do you think is actually, in terms of how intact Hamas is as a fighting force? And, of course, the other point is, you know, it, whatever people, you know, there's the fighting force, but people keep making this point. You can't defeat an idea and Hamas. You could destroy the entire leadership of Hamas and either some another leadership emerges or something else replaces it but i'm just interested what you think about the military facts on the grounds 
as regards Israeli claims? It's difficult to piece it, frankly, because you're getting so varied information coming. Um, I would agree with you that what the IDF is putting out has to be pretty high levels of propaganda because it has to convince people that it's winning in what is a protracted war. So at the one moment it's saying, you know, we're, we're on top and, and essentially Hamas is defeated. And then it's saying, well, this war is going to go on until February or longer. Now, at the rate of destruction, there'll be not very much left of Gaza if that's the case. And what, what will happen to the 2.3 million Gazans, we just don't know. But I think, well, th this is basically sort of going out on a limb. I think, in fact, the war is not going anything like as well for the Israelis as they're leading us to believe. Mm. And I think they're trying to do this. And I say we started off this discussion with the report two weeks ago of that uh, extraordinary, um, well, ba basically, I mean, it, it was a kind of ambush, but it's very heavily worked out, precisely worked out. But this is in part of Gaza, which the Israelis said they're now fully controlled. And it wasn't just a sort of a, a small group of soldiers caught out and killed. These were elite troops, some of the best in the Israeli army. I think that is a real strong indicator that in Hamas, Hamas has a long way to go. Now, it's absolutely possible that Hamas might suddenly collapse. But at the very least, what you will be left with is probably tens of thousands of more young people, young men mainly, but in terms of uh, war fighting, but young people on the Gaza side and also more and more on the West Bank who will support the likes of Hamas or a replacement in spite of all that is also done wrong. So I, I don't see any way in which Israel can come out of this in the longer term um, without many more insecurity problems unless uh, the near impossible happens. It starts to realize you're going to have to actually deal with with the Palestinians on a human rights basis. There's no sign of that at the, at the moment, but that may come in due course. It's possible that if this war could come to a relatively early end, it might prompt sufficient people, including foreign politicians, to say, you've got to start dealing seriously with this. It is, in my personal view, one of the most important things that can do people can do now is actually talk about this. And indeed, I, I think the way in which people are taken to the streets is astonishing. Uh, mm. far more than the mainstream media is reporting. Uh, but that is certainly happening. I, I've experienced uh, where I live myself. But just finally, in terms of legacy, I mean, you, you kind of partly answered part of my question there in terms of what, what this means for Israel long term. It's on its own term, security. So, I mean, its argument would be this is to make Israel more, more secure. But I, I guess in terms of the world order, um, which... You know, I think it's not just actually a self-image of Western elites. There's a self-image often which a lot of Western populations have been encouraged to buy into, um, which is not shared by much of the world, to put it blunt. Much of the world already had a very cynical and, you know, view yeah. of Western power. Iraq obviously brought that into sharp relief, but, mm. you know, Israel and Palestine more generally. Um, but I have to say this, a lot of the world look at this, and just to be blunt, look at this and go, you are taking the piss frankly, in terms of Western power, that these, uh, uh, you know, the, the level of atrocity and widespread destruction, the outright repudiation of even the most basic norms of law, of war, of warfare, about how warfare is supposed to be conducted, according to the Geneva Conventions, which emerged from the rubble of World War II. It, I mean, it's just so flagrant and unsubtle, combined with the rhetoric of the Israeli government, which is so... How, you know, genocidal as, and I, I don't use that flippantly, I'm just deferring to what genocide scholars say. Um, it's not hyperbolic. <laughs> um, I just wonder what you think that legacy will be. I mean, in terms of maybe radicalization, uh, in terms of just the authority, the moral position of the moral authority of, of Western power and the long-term decline of Western power. That's a lot to put in a question, I accept, but I just wondered your general thoughts about that in terms of legacy. I think that relates much more to wider security issues. Uh, and I put it this way. Um, I have a term which I use to describe this attitude in which you basically suppress major threats. And that is a very crude one. It's called lidism. You keep the lid on things rather than actually looking at the underlying reasons why people are revolting or angry. And this can apply to many different things. And I think that's a worldwide trend. So in some ways, I think um, what the Israeli Defense Forces are doing in Gaza is an example of extremism. Uh, 
basically you're really trying to prevent any kind of dissent uh, by any means necessary to ensure your own security. Uh, and that is a phenomenon which I think we're seeing in different contexts, and it's going to get much greater across the world uh, as we come to the, you know, the, the real conflict in the longer term is a security paradigm which is rooted in military defense uh, coming up against a world which is both desperately marginalized because of the failure on the union on the neoliberal side and also of course with climate breakdown coming in you've got a constrained world uh, which is environmentally constrained which is divided and which elite communities in the widened sense including many of ourselves are essentially all about maintaining security and um, that in one way i'm afraid to say i think gaza is an extreme example of a particular attitude uh, which we're seeing in different parts of the world. The attitude to, you know, the, the fact that desperate people trying to get across the English Channel are invaders. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, it's yeah. outrageous. And this, I think, is a risk. So if as we see the destruction in Gaza for what it is, uh, then that's really a, a much wider warning. That doesn't help mm. at all to anybody supporting the Palestinians, but I think that's true. i just add one other thing quickly, which is I missed out entirely at the start. One of the things that people are surprised at is why is Biden still supporting Israel so much? Oh, yeah, yeah. Good it's point. not the Jewish lobby, it's the Israel lobby. And what one has to remember is that many American Jews, probably proportionally more than in Britain, yeah. are bitterly opposed to what uh, the Israeli government is doing. What you're forgetting about, though, and people always forget about that other phenomenon, Christian Zionism. Yeah. And Christian Zionism is that branch of evangelical Christianity which believes that God gave the land of Israel to the Jews to protect until the, the final days. And it goes back well, 120, 130 years. In fact, probably 160 years to the 1820s. And essentially, it is supported by far more people in the United States than the Jewish lobby. I mean, there are 7 million or so Jews in the United States. You're talking about 20 to 30 million evangelical Christians who basically take this view out of the 100 million plus evangelical Christians uh, um, they tend to vote Republican and they tend to vote more than the average. And we have a, a presidential election coming up in less than a year. One has to factor that in, in terms of understanding where Biden is coming from. Domestic US politics plays quite a role in this. I know it's, apart from what we we're talking about, it's a point that people constantly miss. That is it's a really excellent point, which I, I'm glad you made. And actually, what's so striking is the number, if you look at the United States, obviously it's a much bigger Jewish population than here in Britain, but some of the often the, the the new generation of the left that's emerged in the US, many of the leading figures are drawn from um the Jewish community. Historically, of course, the left has always been disproportionately shaped by the contributions of Jewish people, which is partly which uh, the the anti-Semites, of course, of the early 20th century seized upon and talked about international Jewish Bolshevik conspiracies, the Nazis, etc. That sharpened, didn't it? Their mm. hatred of Jews, yeah. the disproportionate always contribution of Jewish people to movements against uh, oppression, against injustice. Um, and it's really heartening and younger generation of Jewish people. I mean, it's interesting younger generations in America and elsewhere, the most pro-Palestinian ever. But that does also include, of course, that that next generation of of young Jews. So it's a very very important point to make, and I keep on this yeah. channel keep signal boosting the those Jewish voices who will be vindicated by history, um, as will those brave courageous fighters for justice in 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 Israel. Well, Paul, that was that was brilliant stuff as ever. People can see why um, his expertise is so in demand, um, and a a counterweight, I would say, to to uh, the rather simplistic. Uh, analysis you generally get on mo most mainstream media outlets. Uh, Paul, and I, I always say this every time I speak to you, but uh, you, you had a big impact on me when I was a teenager. Uh, I studied you actually at my sixth form in Stockport, so it's <laughs> always an honour to, uh, but it's true, uh, always an honour. I know mean, it's probably annoying to hear that, but uh, it's always an honour to speak to you, <laughs> partly because of that. But Paul, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Do like and share this video and, and, and uh, subscribe. But Paul, thank you so much. Will do. Thank you very much and thank you for, for listening so long. Thanks.